Bullshit is the glue. Dinosaur fossils. Dinosaur fossils? God put those here to test our faith. Where would we be without our safe, familiar, American bullshit? I think God put you here to test my faith, dude. God is watching you. God is watching you. You believe that, oh okay? Everything is gonna be just fine. Does that trouble anyone here? The idea that God might be fucking with our heads? The official national bullshit story. Some prankster God running around. <laughs> Probably untrue at one level or another, but we believe them because they're pounded into our heads from the time we're children. That's what they do with that kind of thing. <laughs> we will see who believes in me now. <laughs> I am God, I am a prankster. Pounded into the heads of kids because they know the children are much too young to be able to muster an intellectual defense against a sophisticated idea like that. And they know that up to a certain age, children believe everything their parents tell them. You die and go to St. Peter. Did you believe in dinosaurs? Well, yeah, there's fossils everywhere. <laughs> you fucking idiot! Fly, lizard, you're a moron! God was fucking with you! And as a result, they never learn to question things. Nobody questions things in this country anymore. Nobody questions that. Everybody's too fat and happy. Everybody's got a cell phone that'll make pancakes and rub their balls in it. It seems so plausible. Ah! Americans have been bought off in silence by toys and gizmos. I believe God created me in one day. And no one learns to question things. You remember me? They believe the Bible is the exact word of God, then they change the Bible. Pretty presumptuous. <laughs> I think what God meant to say. Tell the truth, don't be bullshitting people. Don't be bullshitting, there's enough bullshit as it is, folks. Just plenty of bullshit. Suddenly we got Jesus hanging ten across the Sea of Galilee. Christ focus adventure, you know. Children who want to read are going to read. Kids who want to learn to read are going to learn to read. Much more important to teach children to question what they read. Children should be taught to question everything. To question everything they read, everything they hear. A lot of Christians wear crosses around their necks. You think when Jesus comes back, he's going to want to see the fucking cross, man? I don't know. That may be why he hasn't shown up yet. Children should be taught to question authority. But man, they're still wearing crosses. Fuck it, I'm not going, Dad. No, they totally missed the point. When they start wearing fishes, I might show up again. Kids have to be warned that there's bullshit coming down the road. Let me bury fossil heads with you, Dad. Fuck them. Let's fuck with them. Kind of like going up to Jackie on NASA with a rifle pendant on, you know? Sticking to John, Jackie. We love him. Trying to keep that memory alive, baby. That's the biggest thing you can do for a kid. Tell them what life in this country is about. It's about a whole lot of bullshit that needs to be detected and avoided. The world is 4,000 years old. Their shoes, their clothes, their glasses, it's crazy. They're left behind. The people are gone. Why won't you just obey? This is the part that really has gotten me angry. He called the Catholic Church a cult. A child-abusing religious cult. This is the part that really has gotten me angry. 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 Why won't you just obey? Why won't you just obey? A child abusing religious cult. The years passed and mankind became stupider at a frightening rate. Each newly produced infant is given six full years of nightly hypnopedic sleep-teach lectures to reinforce class acceptance conditioning. Later, in central conditioning centers like this, each child receives daily happiness reinforcement drills, as well as prescribed courses in erotic play, death acceptance training, full consumption practice, and nature nausea games. Then, Upon reaching computer lessons after six more years in a final conditioning school, each happy, healthy individual will go forth to take up his or her predestined place in the greater society, dedicated to ensuring the continuing perfection of community, identity, stability. 
excellent and very nicely packaged. You liked the whole film, I mean. Oh, immensely. You caught the whole spirit of unchanging perfection and with admirable simplicity. I'm glad I had a chance to see it before it's computer erased and electro shredded. Computer erased? Electro shredded? Unfortunately, it does contain some dangerously heretical ideas. I made every effort to keep ideas out of it. Take the scene on anti-nature conditioning. Charming scene of little children revolted by fresh flowers. The implication is that nature nausea conditioning is necessary to keep people from enjoying the countryside and thus under-consuming. But that's true. <laughs> Quite beside the point. I just wanted to show why nature nausea training is one of our most recent improvements in... You see? Recent implies past. Improvement implies progress. And if the present is perfect, then there can't be any progress, of course. And even the word why, why, that's the most dangerous of all. It raises the whole question of purpose. No, I'm afraid it would never do to let an ordinary audience watch anything quite as dangerous as your doctor short. But the test audience watched it. They all liked it. You can see right there. Quite meaningless, since they've been conditioned to like anything that's shown them. But... All my work. Exactly the point. Thousands and thousands of feet of film consumed. Hours and hours of work expended by technicians. And once it's been erased and shredded, it can be done all over again. Remember your sleep talk. Don't delay. Consume today. Use it up and throw it away. I'll make a special effort to keep ideas out the next time. Commendable. Even the word why, 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 that's the most that's dangerous, the most dangerous of all. Dangerous of all. There are would-be murderers all around the world who want to kill you and me and themselves because they're motivated by what they think is the highest ideal. Of course politics are important. Iraq, Palestine, even social deprivation in Bradford. But as we wake up to this huge challenge to our civilized values, don't let's forget the elephant in the room, an elephant called religion. The suicide bomber is convinced that in killing for his God, he will be fast-tracked to a special martyr's heaven. This isn't just a problem of Islam. In this program I want to examine that dangerous thing that's common to Judaism and Christianity as well. The process of non-thinking called faith. I'm a scientist and I believe there is a profound contradiction between science and religious belief. There is no well-demonstrated reason to believe in God. And I think the idea of a divine creator belittles the elegant reality of the universe. The 21st century should be an age of reason, yet irrational, militant faith is back on the march. Religious extremism is implicated in the world's most bitter and unending conflicts. We want the non-Muslims off the lands of Muhammad. We want the Kufar out of it. America too has its own fundamentalists. The issue for the next generation is going to be the Islamification of Europe. And in Britain, even as we live in the shadow of holy terror, our government wants to restrict our freedom to criticize religion. Science, we are told, should not tread on the toes of theology. But why should scientists tiptoe respectfully away? 
The time has come for people of reason to say enough is enough. Religious faith discourages independent thought, it's divisive and it's dangerous.
have never understood why it should be necessary to become irrational in order to prove that you care, or indeed why it should be necessary to prove it at all. What we thought was the horizon of our potential turns out to be only the foreground. What happened to the young man I used to be able to share in a concern with and questions on the nature of free will? Those who have most at stake in the old culture or are most rigid in their beliefs try to summon people back to the old ideas. What happened to the young man who so often wondered what it would be like to live free of conditioning? Do not go where the path may lead. Go where there is no path and leave a trail. Um, people think they see with their eyes, but they don't. They, the eyes are part of the decoding process, but it's the brain that constructs reality. We can easily forgive a child whom is frightened of the dark. The real tragedy of life is when men are afraid of the light. You've got tremendous gifts and you've chosen to piss them away. One's vision is not a road map, but a compass. No, I mean, how did the world ever get like this? arrangement of bad eggs will never make a good omelet. Oh, good morning, Dee Dee. Hi, Joe. What's with the shoe? I'm losing my soul. Yeah. Age is a high price to pay for maturity. You wear a mask for so long, you forget who you were beneath it. Believe nothing, no matter where you read it, or who said it, no matter if I have said it, unless it agrees with your own reason and your own common sense. Belief is a program. It makes the brain decode reality in accordance with the belief. This is why religious beliefs, political beliefs, scientific beliefs, all these uh, cultural beliefs are so powerful in um, imprisoning people in this false reality and these in, uh, belief systems, these prison cells. Choosing to act on what matters is the choice to live a passionate existence, which is anything but controlled and predictable. If you knew who walked beside you at all times, on this path that you have chosen, you could never experience fear or doubt again. Those who know about education have no power. Those who have the power know little or nothing about education. Weird feeling being smarter than everyone. Mm -hmm. Not used to it. Yeah, me neither. The excitement of learning separates youth from old age. As long as you are learning, you're not old. Ha! <laughs> you old fox. It's good. Your Excellency does this honor. Rothschild, apparently you've been telling me the truth. So do you know what I'm going to do? No, Excellency. I'm going to charge you 20,000 golden. Yes, the same. But I can't do it. There's not that much money in the whole ghetto. Gracias. You'd like to pay only 2,000 golden again, wouldn't you? It's it. Now, what would it be worth to me? If I put you down for 2,000 this time, 
very handsome present for your excellency. Say, a thousand garden. Dog sense, Rothschild. I want ten thousand. Would you leave me and my family penniless? With well, a great deal of pleasure. Come now. Well, perhaps three thousand garden, but that's the limit. The actual limit. I'll take six thousand. Make it five thousand. <laughs> All right. Have it ready tomorrow. I'll call. And if any of you breathe a word, I'll have your house burned to the ground. No great improvements in the lot of mankind are possible until a great change takes place in their mode. To see that the attempt to complete yourself, to find a more complete and more fulfilled sense of self on the level of the story, that attempt is futile. Because on the level of the story that you are telling yourself in the head of who you are, you're not going to make it. No story has a happy ending. A few false happy endings, such as a wedding, That used to be the traditional happy ending on films and plays. But we all know that's a false happy ending. There's no happy ending because all your achievements are going to dissolve and you're going to die. And then no matter how many millions you have in the bank, it becomes meaningless. And uh, what is left of every story is the two-inch gap between your date of birth and date of death on your gravestone. The dash that contains all the sufferings, all the drama that was part of me and my story. And somebody derived their sense of self from all that. They thought that was who they were. It's sad. They never realized who they are. They were trapped in a fiction, their sense of identity trapped in a fiction for a whole lifetime. Maybe if they were lucky, shortly before their death, or on their deathbed, the whole story collapsed and something else emerged, and that happens occasionally. Occasionally, as death approaches, maybe it's only a few minutes or a few hours away, there's suddenly, and some people who have been sitting with dying, a dying person, have reported that in certain instances something shines through suddenly. It's almost a light that comes through and that happens when the mentally made sense of identity, the fictitious sense of identity, dissolves because that is a heavy, it heavily obscures the light of consciousness that is underneath and it can happen shortly before death that, that that fiction dissolves and suddenly it's like a flowering there's an enormous light shining through as if the a flower had just opened and it could have opened before but it just it opened and only a few minutes before death but at least it opened one could say the purpose of that life is fulfilled. 
But the message here is that you don't need to wait for your death approaching before you can know who you are beyond a mental image of who you are. You don't have to wait for death to approach because you might not get it even then. You may get be trapped in that image even as you die and that means you would die in terrible, terrible fear and, and anxiety because that image is dying, the me is dying. The transformation of consciousness that is happening to each one of you is that kind of death, but it is not the physical death. It's the death of what I call the, the me, or what in some spiritual traditions is called the self which is a mind-made sense of self that is dissolving. So really why we are here is to undergo that death voluntarily. Well, partly voluntarily. <laughs> because if you hadn't gone through great suffering already due to being trapped in a mental image of me, which is a suffering sense of self. A sense of self that is unhappy a lot of the time. So you've been trapped in a suffering sense of self and the suffering has been become so acute that something within you said, this is too much. There must be something else. I can't go on like this. I'm saying this because that happened to me. So, it looks as if you had chosen to come here, and that's fine, that's one perspective on it. But really, you were driven here because you want to die. You want to die that death of the self, the little me in the head, because that's not who you are. Now the little me doesn't want to die, so there are two movements inside you. One is the movement towards liberation, and it's a very strong and increasingly powerful movement to become free of that. Something far vaster is emerging in you than even the most, the, even the heaviest and most dramatic story of me, than even the heaviest me could be that thinks, oh, I'm, I'm so heavy. Nothing, you can sometimes see people, you say, well, there's no chance that they would ever become liberated in this lifetime if you look at the heaviness of their drama and their total identification with the drama of me. But you might be wrong, because very often the most unlikely people suddenly step beyond. And perhaps the, the monk that's been, who's been practicing meditation for 30 years hasn't stepped quite beyond yet. There's still a me and mental image of me as the spiritual one. And, and there, there might be a criminal here in, in a prison cell who suddenly, whose sense of mentally made sense of self suddenly dissolves. And what emerges is great joy, aliveness and peace and a, a state of connectedness with being, a vastness, which is not separate from you, is one with who you are, can only expressed in paradox, it is you and yet much greater than you. So we are here to connect with that 
vastness that lies underneath the storyline of me. And we are allowing the story of me to come to an end. Go all over the world, wherever you will. Every human being on this earth, every human being, whether he live in Russia, China, Asia, India, Europe or here, goes through all kinds of sorrow. Thousands of millions have shed tears. And occasion laughter. Every human being on this earth has had great loneliness, despair, anxiety, confused, uncertain. They kill. Every human being, black, white, purple, or whatever color you like. And psychologically, this is a fact, actuality, not invented by the speaker. This is observable. You can see it on every face on this earth. And so, psychologically, you are the rest of mankind. You may be tall, short, black or white, what color you may be, but psychologically, you are the mankind. Please understand this, not intellectual, or ideologically or a hypothesis, but a, it is an actuality, burning reality, that you psychologically are the rest of mankind. Therefore you psychologically, you are not individual. Those religions, except perhaps parts of Hinduism and Buddhism, have entertained and encouraged the sense of individual growth, saving individual souls and all that business. But in actuality, in your consciousness, your consciousness is not yours, it's the rest of mankind. Because we all go through the same mill, the same endless conflict and so on. When one realizes this, not emotionally, not as an intellectual concept, but as something actual, real, true, then you will not kill another human being. You will never kill another, either verbally or intellectually, ideologically or physically, because then you are killing yourself. But individuality has been encouraged all over the world. Each one struggling for himself, his success, his fulfillment, his achievement, pursuing his desires and creating havoc in the world. Please understand this very carefully.
we are not saying that each individual is important. On the contrary, if you are concerned with the global peace, not just your own little peace in the backyard, nations have become the backyard. If you are really concerned, as most serious people must be concerned, that you are the rest of humanity. That's a great responsibility. So we must go back and find out for ourselves why human beings have reduced the world to what it is now. What is the cause of all this? Why have we made such a mess of everything? We touch both in our personal relationship between man and woman, between each other. Why there is conflict between gods, your God and the other's God. So we must inquire together whether it is conflict whether it's possible to end conflict. Otherwise we'll never have peace in this world. Long before Christianity, they talked about peace on earth. Long before Christianity, in Hinduism, they worshipped trees stones, animals, nature, lightning, the sun. There was never any sense of God before, because they considered the earth as the mother to be worshipped, to be conserved, preserved, spared, not destroyed as we are doing now. Your sense of identity is no longer derived from the content of your mind. Whatever thoughts go through your mind, you are no longer a thought-based entity. Thoughts still happen, but thoughts don't give you an identity anymore. Then thought is not problematic. The continuous stream of thinking is only problematic because your sense of self is trapped in it. That makes life extremely problematic and every thought tells you how problematic your life is. I'm not complete. I need, I want, I must have. Where is it? To complete myself, I'm looking for myself. I want to add something to the content of me. It might be acquisition, it might be material things, it might be relationships, or it may be in higher developed humans' knowledge. It is still the search, nothing wrong with knowledge, but here we are speaking of the self-seeking through knowledge, to seek an, an, a stronger sense of me through knowledge. And you've all, we've all met people whose sense of self is primarily identified with all their knowledge. People, if you go to universities, you meet many of them. I was there. <laughs> In other places, the, the content that, is, that primarily gives you an identity might be appearance. It might be, could be anything. The, it is amazing what that sense of self can use and does use to strengthen itself. From the smallest to the biggest, it will, it can, it's just like 
an animal, like a, maybe a pig, that will eat almost anything and absorb it, and that's me, me. And it's not anything, even a miserable experience can be added to my basket of miserable experiences and I, when my sense of self is predominantly unhappy, as is the case with many, with others it's half-half, happy, unhappy, happy, unhappy. <laughs> In others it's predominantly unhappy and they're telling everybody or themselves in their head there's unhappy story and how they're trying to get out of it. For years they've been trying to get out of their unhappy story of me. And, but their, their primary sense of self, the content with which they are identified in the mind and in the emotional field, mental emotional content, is misery. So when that is the case, what they're looking for to strengthen their sense of self is a further piece of misery because other things wouldn't fit in that basket. They would not be compatible with all these things that are in the basket. If it's predominantly misery, I'm looking for more misery and I myself gets even stronger. A more miserable self. But the ego loves that. That ego feels stronger in that. So the world is full of people who are looking for further unhappy experiences, mad as it might seem, to strengthen their sense of self. It, it, and, the have, it, and you can actually, you can sense it when you have certain sensitivity and presence, when you meet someone who has a very, that very heavy sense of self that is predominantly identified with misery. And, you can, and that, of course, the pain body comes in there, which we may address a little bit later. It, so it wants more of that. It will use anything to strengthen itself. You've all, this is the tiniest things. You all know these, these things that everybody does it, it seems things name dropping and for, that's a, just a tiny example of I want to add something to who I am or I'm, I spoke to such and such that famous man the other day whether it's true or not in many cases it's not true they just why is that because they want to add a bit more content to maybe I get I can a bit bigger. I can. I, they're really. It's all a search for yourself. And it's a never-ending search on that level. And then you might come when you go beyond name-dropping and go beyond deriving a sense of identity from your car. Perhaps all of you have gone beyond that. Well, it's some. <laughs> some. Then you may come to... The, the search may continue on another level. The search continues then on the spiritual level, which is also a search for acquisition to add to the sense of who I am. It could be in the form of greater knowledge. I want to understand the universe. What's it all about? the mystery and I want to and then image forms of me the one who's gone beyond material things the spiritual one and we, you've all met people who are <laughs> and this happens so easily because that tendency of image making and of needing to add to the content of me is so strong even seeking for answers means I want to add more content there's nothing wrong with investigating or examining but I'm speaking here now of doing that in the service of a self to derive a greater self from that 
and that's the delusion. So everyone is trapped in that seeking for a deeper, greater, stronger me, sense of self. It's never enough. It definitely, the, the, who you are now, your story will tell you, who you are now is not enough. The basket isn't full yet. Or what it contains isn't good enough. I need to add better things to my basket, other things. And so I need the future. Without the future, I cannot be myself, is the delusion. I can only complete my sense of identity through having more future, enough future. Please give me more future so that I can know myself. Please give me time so that I can know myself. That is the mind pattern. Because for everything else you need time. Please give me time to make money. You need some time. Please give me time to learn a language. Give me time to find a mate. Give me time to make a cake. Everything requires time. <laughs> And on that level it's fine, you need it, of course you need time for all those things. But then, if you then step into knowing who you are, give me time to know who I am, is the delusion. That's the beginning of the delusion, that you need time to find yourself. And when that is the delusion, your whole life then, all once the delusion that you need time to find yourself is firmly established and it happens quickly then all further activities all further action all further thought all further aims are colored and distorted by that delusion so they're all an expression of the delusion of needing to find yourself. All the desires and fears that dominate a person's life, that provide the motivating power behind what people do, the desires and fears, the basis for that is that mentally made sense of self. It fears that it may never become complete or it might lose the little it has and it desires more content in whatever form some form, some content that's why spiritual traditions speak of dis the desire let go of desire but I'm, I'm not saying let go of desire let's leave that for a while just look at desire why make another problem and say you should let go of desire? <laughs> Just look at it and see how it operates. <laughs> so there's, and then you have what operates on the personal level operates collectively. So the, that personalized sense of me that isn't complete and fulfilled and needs something, never happy with what is, it's not enough, never happy with this moment, it's not enough, not good enough, My, the me is not complete, always at odds with something or someone which it likes because then it feels I know more who I am when I'm at odds with something or someone than when I'm at peace. It doesn't like peace. It likes to be in conflict in one way or another. Because then the me gets stronger in any kind of conflict or opposition. It's, that's the contracted state of me. And it, so you're, these days many people have stress. What does that mean? It means you're in conflict with this moment. 
And that's again part of the whole civilization is a stressful civilization because it's the whole civilization is an externalization of the human consciousness. So everybody is under stress, which means they're in conflict with what is. They don't want to be here they, because they need to be in the future. That's called stress. I need to be there. And you can actually see the reaching out, how stressful it is. It tears you apart. Uh, uh. never quite getting there that reaching out to and it's it's in people's faces they can't be here because they need to be there urgently as you start to see yourself grow into that world your world your way of being in, in the universe the way you are how you are completely changes because you start to see the importance of your observation you see these, you start to see the importance of your interpretation of the field and what you are feeding the you instead of seeing yourself as an insignificant little god that means nothing to the universe you start to see yourself as the center of creation
We are the seed of brand new green. We'll succeed, our time has come. We are the new. These words are true. Let the light of love shine. We shall love the earth and we shall love each other. We shall love those who hate us and we shall love those who love us. We shall not choose between them because all are one and one are more. And that's the truth that's re-emerging in the consciousness of increasing numbers of people on this planet today. inside your head. What you want, what you really need, is a story. A story can be true or false. I leave such judgments to you, Inspector. The reason it's very important to highlight what's going on and to do something about it is because a lot of people, a lot of genuine people, are going to be led up the garden path to do things that they really ought to be, not be doing because they don't know what the game plan is. All for more means more for all. If it can be made, it can be used. And if it can be used, it can be made. History is bunk. Half the time equals double the yield. War is bad for business. The whole basis of the manipulation is to divide us and is to get us to judge each other, to hate each other, to envy each other, to compete with each other and therefore create the very opposite thought patterns, energies that are necessary at this time. Listen to this bullshit. This is our world now. The world of the electron and the switch, the beauty of the bond. We exist without nationality, skin color, or religious bias. You wage wars, murder, cheat, lie to us and try to make us believe it's for our own good, yet we're the criminals. Yes, I am a criminal. My crime is that of curiosity. I am a hacker and this is my manifesto. Huh? Right? Manifesto? You may stop me, but you can't stop us all. Oh, that's cool. Cool? Yeah, cool. You think it's cool? It's cool. It's not cool. It's commie bullshit. As select alphas, conditioned to believe without knowing and to know without believing, you have been chosen to view the surrogate revelations and synthetic mysteries upon which all perfect and placebic belief is founded. The way I kind of see the process of what's happening to so many people in the world now is that when, we, when the consciousness becomes incarnate in a physical body, not all of the consciousness is subject to the great limitations of the body, only that which I'll call the conscious level. What has become known as the subconscious and higher conscious levels of us are not subject to the great limitations of the physical body, and therefore they have a much wider picture. In simple terms, if you saw the conscious level working through the physical body as the spaceman on the moon in the spacesuit and the subconscious and higher as mission control, you see the symbolic difference between the two. One is experiencing and subject to this, the pressures of this level, the other one has the wider picture. This is not a psychotic episode. This is a cleansing moment of clarity. I'm imbued, Max. I'm imbued with some special spirit. It's not a religious feeling at all. It's a shocking eruption of great electrical energy. I feel vivid and flashing as if suddenly I'd been plugged into some great 
electromagnetic field. Here before you are sacred teletime flex relics of the sanctified life, thought, and holy works of our four, from whose divine inspiration came the ultimate perfection of the endless assembly line, which has given us the ultimate endless, perfect happiness of more things, for more wants in perfect balance, with more wants for more things. Imagine a uh, spaceman on the moon in the big space suit. He's got information coming in through the eyes and the ears that tell him about what's going on immediately around him. That's one source of information and perception. But he's also getting mission control that has the wider picture speaking to him. And so he's got two sources of information, the wider picture of the mission and the localized here and now around him information. And that's great. That's a great balance. And therefore, he's got a perception of the whole picture. What would happen, however, if someone came along and snipped or dramatically reduced the power of his link with mission control? Suddenly, there he is, stuck in this very uh, limiting spacesuit, and the only information that he is receiving in which to perceive and behave and decide is suddenly coming in through the eyes and the ears. It wouldn't be long after that point was reached when his behavior and perception would be dramatically different to what it would have been had mission control been part of his um, information source. I feel connected to all living things, to flowers, birds, all the animals in the world, and even to some great unseen living force what I think the Hindus call prana. There's not a breakdown. I've never felt more orderly in my life. It is a shattering, beautiful sensation. It is the exalted flow of the space-time continuum, save that it is spaceless and timeless. Oh, such loveliness. I feel on the verge of some great ultimate truth. Let us now repeat the catechism. Community. Community. Identity. 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 Stability. Stability. For bless you. And my feeling is, the feeling of many other people, is that the pressures of this world de-link us from higher levels of ourselves and so we become dominated by this information above all else and who's got control of this information our old friends who control the media the education system etc et centuries ago in primitive times before the dawn of civilization there were things that would be inconceivable to us today such things as poverty although there was actually land and food in abundance some starved, because unlike our perfect society, they were unable or unwilling to balance population to consumption. Sometimes too much of one, or too little of the other. The result? Disease. And rather than eradicate the sources of disease as we have done, the superstitious primitives continue to rely upon a quite useless class of technicians called doctors. Violence which the ancients actually appear to have enjoyed and reveled in. While we have been perfectly conditioned to want only what we have, and to have only what we want, and are therefore always happy, the uncivilized ancients will prey to destructive emotions, such as ambition, hate, and love which of course always led to violence, which in turn, naturally, led only to more violence. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of snakes is under their lips, and their mouths are full of bitterness and curses, and in their paths, nothing but ruin and misery, and the fear of God is not before their eyes have taken the hearts and minds of our leaders. They have recruited the rich and the powerful, and they have blinded us to the truth. 
Our human spirit is corrupted. Why do we worship greed? Because outside the limit of our sight, feeding off us, perched on top of us from birth to death, are our owners. Our owners. They have us. They control us. They are our masters. Wake up. They're all about you, all around you. segments of code that have grouped together to form unexpected protocols. Unanticipated, these free radicals engender questions of free will, creativity, and even the nature of what we might call the soul. Why is it that when some robots are left in darkness, they will seek out the light? Why is it that when robots are stored in an empty space, they will group together rather than stand alone. How do we explain this behavior? Random segments of code? Or is it something more? When does a perceptual schematic become consciousness? When does a difference engine become the search for truth? When does a personality simulation become the bitter moat of a soul? Your name, your name 
call that the basket into which further experiences, further content is thrown and in which it accumulates. And then that basket, that is the basket is the name that you think you are, that your parents gave you. That becomes the receptacle for experiences that are accumulated, knowledge that is accumulated, successes, defeats, sufferings, relationships, all those things gradually form a, a whole that is the me, that is a mentally derived sense of self. I'll just ask you for a moment to imagine that you don't have a name. What that feels like. Not if, if you don't know who you are on the level of concepts. That is, let's just for a moment, if that is possible, imagine that that basket doesn't hold together anymore. What is there if you are not the name and that which is accumulated in that receptacle? And of course the name is just sounds. It's just sounds that come out of your mouth. And, and, or if it's not pronounced, it is an image in the head. And that's me. And what is there when that goes? So you can't remember your name. And you are comfortable with not knowing your name. Then the experiences that have been accumulated, all the conditioning doesn't quite hold together anymore. It's still there, but it's not a me. Things have happened where this form is. Things have happened to this form, but it's not it's no longer a, a person there. Simply a field of awareness, which is what you are. And the story that you have been telling yourself in the head of who you are, becomes unimportant. It does not give you an identity anymore. You don't derive your sense of self anymore from the story in the head, which is accumulated experiences, accumulated knowledge, and a sense of self derived from that accumulation. Content of the mind. And every experience is content. Everything that happens to you, some experiences are become stored up, they become part of the accumulation and they the self they become they strengthen the sense of self. They are accumulated to enhance the sense of self. So in the when you live in that way from a fictitious sense of self, you're always looking for things to enhance your sense of self, to strengthen it or to protect it, that sense of me. Because some of the content you might lose or you want to add to who you are. Not the sense of not being complete is an essential ingredient of the fictitious sense of self. Everybody has that. And everybody interprets that as a personal problem. That very sense of not being complete becomes part of who you are and who you are striving to be. Haven't arrived yet. And all, even those people who 
are being told by the world that they have arrived have the feeling that they haven't arrived yet and there's something wrong with the world must have gotten it wrong they're telling me that I have made it and I, I can feel that I haven't made it and then you read about people who have everything fame and fortune and good looks and then they have they can't stop drinking and they need to go from one psychiatrist to another have they made it and in our culture they are shown as examples of this is you too can achieve that <laughs> This morning, we are to talk about two things, order and fear. What is order? <coughs> that word has a great deal of significance. Order from a from a general to his soldiers, order, ecclesiastic order, monastic order, order in one's house, order in the garden, and so on. That word has extraordinary meaning. We have tried to establish order in society by laws, by authority, by policemen, and so on. S society, the thing in which we are caught, is created by each one of us, by our parents past generations. And that society is in disorder, confused. That society has almost become immoral. That society is breeding wars. Enormous sums are spent on armaments. In that society there is division. Conflict. There's the totalitarian society and the so called democratic society. Whether it is the totalitarian or democratic, there is still disorder, confusion. Each individual asserting himself aggressively against others, and so there is general disorder. That disorder is created by all of us, because we live in disorder. Our house is in disorder, not the physical house, but the psychological house, our, which is our consciousness. is dis in disarray, disturbed, broken up, contradictory. If one may point out, this is not an entertainment. Intellectual or otherwise, We are talking about human problems. And this, if I may again point out, this is not a lecture. A lecture being giving certain information, having a discourse on a particular subject in view either to convince, to do some kind of propaganda 
and so on. This is not a lecture in that sense. But together we are investigating, we are exploring into the question of order and disorder. Well, <coughs> our minds are in disorder. Can such a mind create order, bring about order? That's the first problem we have to face. Most of us in our daily life are in confusion, uncertain, contradictory, psychologically deeply wounded, psychologically having no right relationship with another, and in that relationship there is contradiction, disorder, disharmony, and so our life, probably from the moment we are born till we die, we live in disorder. One wonders if one is aware of it. We went to the question of what is aware, to be aware. To be conscious, to recognize the fact that one is in disorder. If one is at all aware of that fact, and if one is, do we escape from it, seeking a solution, or accept? a pattern of order, a design of order, and therefore conform to a particular norm. Are we aware of all these psychological movements born out of disorder? And How does this disorder come about? Why, after so many millennia upon millennia, we live in psychologically in disorder, and therefore outwardly in disorder? Outwardly, our disorder is expressed in multiple forms. As a nationality, division among people, religious divisions, wars, and so on. So, we are asking is it possible to be free of this disorder, the ending of disorder, and therefore, and the very ending is order. Order is virtue. You cannot possibly discipline the mind to become orderly. Because the entity who desires order, that entity himself is the result of confusion. And therefore, whatever order it creates must bring about disorder. I hope we are all serious this morning. It's not as we pointed out over and over again. This is a serious affair. Life is becoming so terribly dangerous, uncertain. It's an actuality, and any serious pers person 
concerned with the whole problem of living, must question all this. How does disorder come about? What is the root of it? When we ask a question of this kind, you are asking the question, not the speaker. You are asking the question of yourself. And trying to find out the root of this disorder. Is it desire? Is it very nature and the structure of thought itself is disorder? That is, thought itself is disorder. We are asking that question. Does disorder arise out of desire? Does disorder arise out of the very act of thinking? That is, is thought the source of disorder? Probably most of us have not even asked such a question. We accept and live in disorder. We see that is our condition and we must accept that condition. And so we become used to disorder, accept it, and trying to modify it. But we never ask of ourselves why we live in disorder, psychologically, inwardly, within the skin, as it were. And what is the root of it? The very substance that makes, brings about disorder. My name is Dan Winter. I'm a psychophysiologist. I work in biofeedback and have discovered some very interesting things about the electrical nature of emotion. And in the process of doing that, we've been doing uh, frequency signatures or harmonics of the heart at the moment when people feel bliss and joy and compassion. And we've discovered that at moments when people have intense emotions, their heart creates frequency pictures which are a powerful indicator that they're doing something electrical inside their body when they have emotions. The new discoveries suggest that the power to change our bodies and to change our world is based in what we call belief. Belief. Our belief of what is real. We live our lives based in what we believe about our world. I was trained as a scientist. When I began to understand that we live our lives based upon our beliefs, my question is, where do those beliefs come from? And what I found is that those beliefs come from what other people tell us. The beliefs come from what history tells us, what science tells us, what religion tells us, what our culture, what our family, our friends tell us. That's where our beliefs come from. Would you agree with that? So let me ask a question. What if they're wrong? What if they're wrong? What if you and I are living our lives in the beliefs of other people who are incorrect? What does that mean for us? How powerful do you think a belief really is? How powerful? Truly. There's an author, his name was Neville, in the early 20th century. He wrote a book called The Power of Awareness, beautiful book. And what Neville said was this, he said that our power of belief is a power, an infinite power against which no earthly force is of the slightest significance. Our power of belief 
is an infinite power against which no earthly force is of the slightest significance. Do you believe that you have a power within you against which no earthly force is of the slightest significance? Is that possible? Do you believe that? In 1927, at the fifth Solvay Conference on Physics in Brussels, Belgium, a new proposal of mind over matter was admitted to try to resolve inexplicable behaviors on quantum mechanics. With the greatest minds in physics attending, such as Einstein, Pauli, Dirac, Bohr, Heisenberg, Curry, de Broglie, Schrodinger, just to name a few, the subject of consciousness and the atomic world was at hand. Heisenberg and Bohr approached Einstein with a new theory that the minds of the researchers were affecting the results of the experiments. The mathematics of predictability were not repeatable and reliable enough to explain what was happening. Einstein could not accept this at first because it violated all mathematical models. Years later, he admitted it was happening. Einstein said, Anyone who becomes seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that there is a spirit manifest in the laws of the universe, a spirit vastly superior to that of man. A spirit is not a mechanical force like gravity, electromagnetism, or the strong and the weak forces. A spirit is consciousness. So for Einstein to have made this great transformation can only mean that something convinced him that it was really happening, that the universe is alive and we are part of it. Did great powers hide the truth about what was discovered at the conference because they knew they could not control us if we knew the secret powers of our minds and collective consciousness? All matter originates and exists only by virtue of a force. We must assume behind this force is the existence of a conscious and intelligent mind. This mind is the matrix of all matter. Max Planck, the father of quantum physics. Rumi reminds us, you are song, a wished for song. Go through the ear to the center, where sky is, where wind, where silent knowing. Put seeds and cover them. Blades will sprout where you do your work. So now here we have some pictures of the genetic material. And again, this is the top-down view of, of the DNA right here. And you can even zoom in on a bit. But it turns out that if you map the way the DNA helix is ratcheted, the golden ratio is the distance between the rungs of the ladder right there. Okay, And the golden ratio squared, it, that's called the vertical increment of turn. The golden ratio, or phi squared right there, is the horizontal increment of turn. And then the radius of the term, which is this distance from here to here, in angular measure, is golden mean cubed. So length, area, and volume, golden mean, golden mean squared, and golden mean cubed, are preserved in a ratchet. It's a simple way of saying that no matter how you cook it, genetic material uses this ratio. In fact, if you look at the center uh, rung, or one step on the ladder of DNA, it's one codon rung of the ladder. The geometry of that rung is often modeled as a golden ratio pentagram, stars within stars, where all the ratios are golden mean, and the center bond in the DNA down the zipper is actually, it's, a non, it's called a nonlinear hydrogen bond. It's often been thought of as being responsible for aging, the stability of that bond at the zipper down the slinky. is also a golden mean rectangle. And we can see that here, where the actual models of how the DNA rung works, you have a pentagonal bond next to a hexagonal bond. 
And that 5-6 relationship right there, here shown in the guadalupe cytosine relationship, and also in the adenine-thymine relationship. These are just how the ladder or the slinky of DNA is braided. And that brings us to the little picture of the slinky. Let's look at the slinky here for a second. <clears throat> See, what happens because your DNA looks like a slinky is the fact that there's a mechanical way to couple a short wave to a long wave. For example, uh, quartz is a slinky, the SiO2, the silicon dioxide helix of the long z-axis optically of quartz, is also a slinky like DNA. Now the reason Mother Nature uses slinkies in order to teach us about how to connect long waves and short waves is very easy to understand. What happens in a slinky is, here is my hand changing the length of this slinky like this. Okay, that's a long wave. Okay? But as I do it, notice that the sides of the slinky get skinnier. So I have the sides of the slinky getting skinnier like this. See how that pulls in and gets skinnier? While the length of the slinky is a long wave, the width of the slinky is a short wave. And yet these two motions are connected. Long wave, sound, or stricture it's called, in piezoelectricity, and short wave, or voltage. So here you have a sound wave, a long wave, connected mechanically because of the slinky to a short wave, a voltage. And that's one of the ways in which Mother Nature uses the slinky shape of DNA to connect long waves to short waves. Well, the fun part of our magnetic X story is that in genetic material, what happens is the DNA is mechanically connected to the sound waves of the heart. The DNA is mechanically connected to the sound waves of the heart. The DNA is mechanically connected to the sound waves of the heart. I think the most important implication is that from very simple formulas you can get very complicated results. It's fundamental from viewpoint of the very base of science. Because what is science? We have all this mess around us, things are totally incomprehensible, and then eventually, more or less rapidly, more or less hard to achieve, we find simple laws, simple formulas. In a way, a very simple formula, Newton's law, which is just also a few symbols, can, by hard work, explain the motion of planets around the sun and many, many other things, the 15th decimal. It's marvelous, a very simple formula explains all these very complicated things. There's an interesting parallel with the equation that almost everybody is familiar with, the only equation that everybody is familiar with, E equals mc squared, Albert Einstein's equation that says matter and energy are equivalent to each other. That was a very simple equation with very far-reaching consequences. And the equation for the Mandelbrot set is equally simple. Z equals Z squared plus C. The letters in the Mandelbrot equation stand for numbers, unlike those in Einstein's equation where they stand for physical quantities, mass, velocity, energy. The Mandelbrot numbers are coordinates, positions on the plane, defining the location of a spot. Another difference from Einstein's equation, and a very important one, is this double arrow. It's a kind of two-way traffic sign. The numbers flow in both directions, constantly feeding back on themselves. This process of going round and round a loop is called iteration. It's rather like a dog chasing its own tail. The output of one operation becomes the input of the other, and so on and on and on. When the Mandelbrot equation is given a number representing a point, and that number is iterated through the equation, one of two things happen. Either the number gets bigger and bigger, shoots off to infinity, or it shrinks to zero. Depending on which happens, the computer then knows where to draw a boundary line. So what we get from this basic iteration is a kind of map dividing this world into two distinct territories. Outside of it are all the numbers that have the freedom of infinity. Inside it, numbers that are prisoners trapped and doomed to ultimate extinction.
There is a community of the Spirit. Join it and feel the delight of walking in the noisy street and being the noise. Drink all your passion and be a disgrace. Close both eyes to see with the other eye. Open your hands if you want to be held. Sit down in this circle. Quit acting like a wolf and feel the shepherd's love filling you. At night, your beloved wanders. Do not accept consolations. Close your mouth against food. Taste the lover's mouth in yours. You moan, she left me, he left me. Twenty more will come. Be empty of worrying. Think of who created thought. Why do you stay in prison? When the door is so wide open, move outside the tangle of fear thinking. Live in silence. Flow down and down in always widening rings of being. We don't.